it's a privilege to introduce everyone to our keynote speaker. Uh, Dr. Ifros is Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at UC Berkeley and member of the Bayer Lab. Prior to that, he was nine years on the faculty of Carnegie Mellon University and also um, been affiliated with École Normale Supérieure, INRIA, and University of Oxford. His research is in the area of computer vision and computer graphics, especially at the intersection of the two. He is particularly interested in using data-driven techniques to tackle problems where large quantity, quantities of unlabeled visual data are readily available. Dr. Ifros received his PhD in 2003 from UC Berkeley. He is a recipient of many, many awards, uh, the Sloan Fellowship, the Guggenheim Fellowship, the Okawa Grant, SIGGRAPH Significant New Researcher Award, three PAMI TC Helmholtz Test of Time Prizes, the ACM Prize in Computing, and Diane McIntyre Award for Excellence in Teaching Computer Science. And I'd like to welcome uh, Professor Ifros. Um, thank you very much for, uh, for a kind invitation. And, uh, and um, I'm, uh, I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but uh, I'm, it sounds like you guys are having an in-person day. Uh, we, uh, on our side of the bay, have also been starting to do some, uh, some in-person stuff. We just had a workshop on Friday. And let me tell you, it's wonderful. It's so nice to, to, to get away from Zoom. But... Well, here I am. Um, so I am going to give a kind of a, a general talk on self-supervision, uh, something that we have been working in my lab for a, a number of years. Um, but I, I, if, if, if there is some points that people want to ask um, along the during the talk, this is perfectly fine, and it's it's fine if I don't get through all of it. I can I can skimp at the end. Uh, so I, since I don't quite understand the type of things that you guys might be interested in, um, please do stop me. And you know, if something is unclear, or we can you know talk about this later on uh, in the in the in the question answer. Okay, so um, let's start with what is self supervised learning. Okay, this is a term that um, kind of re-emerged. It was it 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 actually existed in you know since at least the 90s, if not earlier, uh, but uh, it has re-emerged that partially due to to my lab's work, we really like this term, so we kind of dragged it back from uh, from uh, from history. Uh, it doesn't really have a very good definition. Um, here is my definition, which I like, which is self-supervised learning is using the tools of supervised learning, but with the raw data instead of human generated, human provided labels, okay? So unsupervised learning generally, you know, I think of clustering and things like this, right? Supervised learning is different classifier classifiers and things like this. And self-supervised learning is using those tools of, of su supervised learning like classification, but, without these human provided labels. So somehow getting the data to supervise itself. So this is kind of a, a beautiful, beautiful story. Um, before I begin, maybe, you know, why don't we think about why, you know, why use self-supervision, right? What's the reason for using self-supervision? And kind of the classic answer uh, that I hear a lot is, well, self-supervision is great because you know, labels are expensive, right? So instead of clicking on lots and lots and lots of images uh, over and over and over again, wouldn't it be great if the, if we didn't have to do that? If we just kind of just just had the data supervise itself. So this this is a common answer, and there there is some truth to that answer, but it's not my favorite answer. And the reason is that I think I think that if for many tasks, uh, supervised learning, classic supervised learning, actually probably is a much better thing to do than self-supervised learning. And those criteria to me is, is the following. If your training task and your training this da data distribution 
are the same as your test task, test task and test distribution, supervised classic cell, supervised learning is almost always preferable. Okay. So if it if you're able, if you're in a scenario when you know exactly what you want the computer to do at test time, and that is what you can provide to the computer at training time, then actually it probably it's worth just trying to get get lots of money and just label your data it's probably the best thing that you can do um uh here is a couple of examples uh, so one is from self-driving cars um this is this is something that i thought actually you know self supervised learning might be useful but then talking to my friends in 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 that in those areas they say, well, you know, we don't really need to do it because, as for example, Tesla, you know, uh, uh, Andre Karpati somewhere said that, you know, we just we use our our drivers as the source of supervision, and we just collect all this data. And even if we need to do some labeling, that's not so bad. And so here is my kind of back of the anvil of calculation. Uh, you know, the 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 distribution of all the roads in the world you think it's actually very huge but it's not really that bad because you know uh there is about eight billion people right now living on earth right but there's only 24 million uh kilometers of road on earth so basically that's that means that you get 120 22 people per kilometer of road on earth. And so then asking one of those 122 people to label a one kilometer of the road near their home or to drive around on their on their car and kind of sell, you know, get get the car to label it for you is actually not that crazy of an ask, right? This is not really that bad. And and the nice thing is that what you get is you get kind of what you what you need from that labeling it's not like you're hoping that somehow the labeling that you have is is you know will it be aligned with what you actually want or not well no because you know you want to have you know you want to drive safely at training time and you want to drive safely at test time so you know there is a very nice alignment of data as well as tests um another uh example that may be closer to to what you folks are thinking about is uh uh, CD scans. I you can't imagine how many times people uh, uh, from medical imaging and doctors come contact me because you know our lab has been doing a lot of work on GANs, and 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 they say, oh, can we use your GANs to to generate more training data for our for our algorithms? And to me, that always sounded very strange because getting GANs to generate good training data is extremely hard and it will never be as good as real training data right so it's it's really it's especially in something as critical as health you think that you know you really want high quality data and the thing is like you do have quite high quality data right there is i don't know uh tens of millions of ct scans available in the world with with health outcomes right now they are all distributed across the, the the world, but they exist. And so it seems to me that in these kind of cases, the cases, it's actually much better off just going and 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 trying to get this data and putting it all together. And it, of course, it's a lot of work, but the quality of the models that you get from this real data will almost always be better than whatever we can do with self-supervised learning. Okay. So with this caveat, then why why self supervision? So for me, I have three reasons, three answers to this question, uh, and here they are. Answer number one is to get away from semantic categories. Answer number two is to get away from fixed data sets, and answer number three to get away from fixed objectives. Okay. So I'll I'll stop. I'll spend most of my time on one, do a little bit on two, and maybe I'll touch on three if we have time. But but maybe not. Okay. 
So getting away from semantic categories. So why, why is that? Why is it important? Well, semantic categories are actually problematic. Okay. And here is a couple of examples. So here is an example from kind of a standard object object uh, uh, object data sets that that everybody everyone knows and loves you know image net or places so this is this is this are examples from the category chair okay and if you look at them you realize how amazingly varied those examples of the category chair are and you also realize that the reason that we humans can tell that all of them are chairs is really because we have a lot of experience uh, with 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 these things as 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 affordances, as as something that that we interact with, right? So the reason we know this is a chair is because kind of we are aware of you know squeezing our own bottoms into into things and then you know putting you know taking a, a sitting posture that way um but a computer that has never seen anyone you know sit down has now doesn't have a bottom of its own just looking at these example images that's just not enough information to realize that there is something in common here because what's in common is not really in appearance but more in the functional kind of a use of, of these different examples. So you're asking the computer to find something in common between things which really don't really have that much in common. Uh, another example is, is these two uh, pictures both have a labeled city, okay? So this is this is downtown Pittsburgh where I spend a lot, lot of time and this is center of Paris where I also spend a lot of time. And let me tell you, the fact that both of them are by some fluke of the English language named with the same English town, city, that, that is actually not helpful at all for trying to, to, to recognize them. Because if you look at them, there is really nothing, there is not a single pixel in common between these two things, okay? You can say, well, you know, both of them have buildings, right? But look at the buildings. The, the buildings are completely different. You wouldn't know that both of them are buildings unless kind of you, you walked into them and kind of interacted with them yourself. And you could say, well, wait a minute, but you know, they, the buildings, they all have windows. But again, look at this, the windows here and the windows here, they don't look like each other at all. And it's like this all over the place. It's really these two are, have very little in common visual. Their, 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 their commonality is functional, not visual. But again, a computer doesn't ever see, doesn't ever experience cities except for these images. And of course, then the computer is really kind of at a loss. So we're really, um, with labels like these, we're basically setting up our, our systems to fail because really the best thing that a computer would do in this kind of case is what I did when I was an undergrad and I didn't really go to lectures. I didn't really understand ma ma the material. So I would just cram for the exam. I just try to memorize typical questions and the typical answers, right? And that's exactly what, what a lot of the times the, 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 the classifiers are doing. They say, well, I have no idea how these two are related, but I'm just gonna try to remember this, try to remember this, and then hopefully at test time, we'll get something simple, okay? Which is not really what we want, okay? And so the problem really goes all the way back to the, the ancient Greeks, right? Uh, kind of the, the, I, the classical view of categories dates back to Plato and Aristotle, and this, this I, the idea was that, that a category is defined by a list of properties that are shared by all elements. Category membership is binary, either you're a city or you're not a city, uh, and every member of a category is equal, okay? So this was kind of the, the, the platonic story for categories that actually most of us still kind of carry on with in our brain, you know, 2000 years later, even though humans actually in, in, in actual uh, experience and trying to understand the world, humans don't appear to do this at all. Even though we think we do this, we don't actually seem to be doing this. Uh, and uh, um, 
uh, Wittgenstein and, and following that Eleanor Roche here at Berkeley had a really kind of nice rebuttal in the 20th century about why these are not really what, what, what we humans do. So we don't really rely on this abstract definitions or list of shared properties. Uh, Wittgenstein's classic example was, can you define a list of properties shared by all games? Okay. And the answer is no, there is no, it's impossible to do that. There's the game, the, all the games could be so varied. There is no, not a single thing that's in common between all of them. Um, and other, other kind of platonic uh, uh, ideas like typical, uh, like, like uh, binary membership, right? But either you are a bird or you're not a bird. Well, it's not quite so simple because, you know, chicken is a bird, right? But when you think of a bird, you really think of eagles and sparrows and not really chickens. So, so there is, seems to be some kind of inequality within categories. Uh, there is also weird language dependence, right? So for example, in my native Russian, there is not a single word for chair. We have three words, stool, kiesli, and tabriatka. And um, so that kind of suggests that if I'm writing a, a, a object detector in, in Russian, then somehow I get a different result than if I were coding it up in America, which, which doesn't make sense. Um, and so in the kind of mi middle 20th century, people started uh, to feel that instead of this top-down kind of categorization kind of imposed from this platonic ideals, a better model might be a bottom-up association, okay? And so Eleanor Roche uh, proposed the prototype theory and then that followed on the exemplar theory. Uh, and I like the way uh, Moshe Barr talks about this uh, uh, in, in, in his papers. He says, he, he says, ask not what is it, ask what is it like? So the idea is instead of having uh, this ideal, ideal platonic chair and then listing everything that fits that platonic chair, the idea is to start from the bottom, start from the data itself, and see if you can kind of cluster and connect it together and associate different examples with each other. Uh, and hopefully you'll get something, uh, something emerging from the bottom up. Um, this is something that I've been thinking about for a, for a very long time. Uh, this is our uh, work from a decade ago where we, we thought, you know, instead of thinking about kind of standard classification, for example, you know, classify you know one class from another class or one class from everything else uh, and back then svms were all, all all you know exciting and hot so we were using svms uh and that argument is that it might be that really there might be nothing in common between your positive category and so what we propose to do is to instead do one every single instance classify that against everything else in the universe. And so, and then we have a kind of a con ensemble of, of these one instance against everything. And we found that that basically worked as well as this category classifier. But in addition to that, it, you, you were always also able to uh, get other extra nice things like you get correspondence basically for free because you get, a, you find things that are sim very similar to this particular thing. So. So it, it was kind of a nice uh, way to think about categorization without the, the idea of, uh, of categories. Uh, and then we also used it for image retrieval where it's kind of the same kind of idea. You know, you take an image and then you, go, you when you want to find the kind of the closest set of images, you again, just basically train a classifier from that training image from this, from this uh, input image to everything else in your data set. And it turns out that the closest one, closest uh, kind of the hardest negatives that your classifier finds are uh, good matches for for this image. Okay, so this was this was a, a decade ago, and then when neural networks came about, we tried really hard to update it to 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 convolutional kind of neural networks, and nothing really worked for us. So we kind of gave up. But another group. Uh, uh, Dusavitsky and colleagues, uh, they actually did manage to make it work with CNNs. And this is their work of exemplar CNNs. Uh, and basically the idea was to, again, use a single example and then train a 
a neural network to classify that single instance against everything else in the data set. The only thing that they that, that they may uh, you know the reason why our things didn't work and their theirs did is that instead of just having a single instance, they added a bunch of other positive instances, which were basically just very uh, variations of that instance. What's what we call now data augmentation. So basically, we take an imp the the instance and then we flip it, change the color, blah blah. blah but it's basically the same data. Okay. But there's just now more of that. And this was the positive set, and then everything else was an negative set, and then it worked very well. And you know, fast forward to more or less now, and now this is a very big area, this kind of similarity learning, uh, uh, the latest is contrastive learning, but basically it's all the same idea, right? You kind of, we give up on the whole category story and we say, okay, let's have, um, Let's have a single instance. We create a few positives from that single instance by doing data augmentation. And then we try to separate, push it as far away from other instances as we can. And that produces a good, uh, good uh, problem, self-supervised learning problem that we can then create good uh, features. Uh, so, you know, and again, the, you know, why is it like, it's it's been getting better and better. You can see lots and lots of works on this. And so, you know, part of the reason that it's been um, successful is you know we definitely have gen genuine improvements in in the in the techniques. For example, the contrastive learning was definitely better than kind of the Siamese networks that we used before. But I think maybe more importantly, we're getting better and better and learn at learning how to generate this data augmentation how to create these multiple positive instances. So again, kind of data augmentation, let's say you have your image and then you want to create multiple versions of this, of this input image. And what you do is you basically just randomly perturb this image with various perturbations. Maybe change the color, maybe do some cropping, maybe flip the image left, right, maybe blur. Et cetera, et cetera. There's a whole list of things that, that one can do. Okay. And then you just add it to your positive set. Okay. Well, it's unfortunately there is no free lunch because as we have been getting better and better at this data augmentation, we begin to realize that that itself is a kind of a form of supervision. The, the choice of which augmentations to use here is, 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 is you know, proposed by the programmer. So there is actually a human figuring out what would be good augmentation. And what we find uh, in this paper is that actually the choice of augmentation is extremely important for doing well and doing well on different tasks, you need different augmentation. So for example, um, if, your, if your goal is to do you know, normal kind of categorization like image net categorization, then uh, you know, augmenting with color and augmenting with different textures, that, that is very helpful. But you know, rotating the image actually turns out not to be very helpful because an upside down elephant is that that will never happen in practice. And so you are actually going to make it worse for your classifier, okay? On the other hand, if your goal is fine grain uh, uh, categorization, for example, you want to tell apart different types of birds, well, then actually none of those augmentations are good because you know, if you change the color of a bird, it actually could be a different bird. If you rotate the bird, the same thing. Uh, uh, well, you know, upside down birds you'd never see. And then texture of the bird also is very useful. On the other hand, for something like fine grain categorization for flowers, the rotation is perfectly fine because flowers are rotationally symmetric. Okay. And so basically, it sounds like we, you know, we were hoping to get away from this yoke of the human labeler. But now we are under the yoke of the human uh, data augmentation inventor. And again, we are, kind of, we are 
we're forced to, you know, to hack what, what is a good augmentation. And so what we were thinking about uh, trying to do in our, um, in, our, uh, in our group is to try to see if we can get, uh, try to not use data augmentation, okay? Or rather to somehow create these data augmented views on their own without using human, okay? Now, of course, the question is, like, how do you get the supervisory signal? Where do you, where do you get the supervision? Um, and for one of the projects, we thought that the very nice and natural supervision signal is, is time, okay? Uh, let me quote from uh, one of my favorite uh, authors, Jorge Luis Borges, uh, in this uh, uh, short story about uh, uh, a man on the spectrum. It irritated him that a dog at 3.14 in the afternoon seen in profile should be indicated by the same noun as the dog at 3.15 seen frontally, right? So for, for this gentleman, it, he could not figure out that this and these dogs are actually the same dog, okay? But most of us can figure out that this is the same dog. Why? Because the time binds them together. Because we know that it's very, very unlikely that somehow we, dogs were switched and that this dog is different from this dog, right? We know that like time preserves identity. And so that made us think that time might be a very good supervision for what should be the same and what should be different. Uh, there is also a, a, an example, a very, very nice work, paper by Wood to show that uh, uh, chicks that are just born chicks, uh, temporal consistency turns out to be very important to them. And if you don't get if you if you only see input that's not temporally consistent, the, the chicks have major problems with their visual system. So uh, nice motivation from there. So basically the idea is using video as a source of data augmentation. So basically saying that th there is some this and that and those should all be considered one thing, should all be kind of a, on the positive side, okay? Uh, and then, of course, you can you can kind of uh, reason with common fate and and talk about segmentation and grouping as well using that that motivation. Okay, and so people have have had this idea for a while, trying to use you know temporal coherence across frames or to, trying to mine correspondences. But this was also kind of a little bit of hodgepodge approach. And so what we proposed the uh, last neurops was to see if we can do it all in one kind of nice framework using uh, a random walk on a graph. And so here I'll, here I'll just give you a little bit of a, of a taste of, 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 of what, um, what the, the idea. So imagine that we, for once, let's say, let's say that we do have uh, supervision, that somebody, some human came and said that this patch matches this, with this patch, okay? That these two should be, should be together, they should be positive, okay? Well, this is all fine. We have this kind of nice correspondence, but because it's a video, we know that this patch should get back to here. But then, it's in the in the middle, in a in a in a in a frame in the middle, it should go for somewhere reasonable. Okay, and so we find a patch, the most likely patch through which it can go through. And we realize that it's probably going to be this one, okay? And so now we were given that these two patches are the same patch by a human, but now we can also augment it with this frame and say, okay, well, if these two are the same, then it must be this one because where else would it go from, okay? And so now we can have added one more extra latent view to our data augmentation, okay? So this is good, but we can do better. And here is how we can do better. Now we can get rid of this human supervision altogether by making a palindrome out of our video. So our video is, is one, two, three frames. What we can do is we can flip the video backwards and get it back to where we started. Okay, so flip the arrow of time and say frame one, frame two, frame three, and then frame two, frame one. And now 
we can try to find a, a kind of a cycle through this video starting and ending at the same place. Okay, but then in the middle, it needs to do something reasonable. It needs to find a good path. So here I'll, it will basically try to find what is a good correspondence. And then eventually, kind of the idea is that we're going to walk through this graph and we will find what is the most likely path. And now those things that our path goes through, they all automatically become uh, our positives. And then we are able to create a set of positives, kind of generate data augmentation automatically without using any, any, any hacks and without any human supervision, okay? So the idea is we make this palindrome graph, we take our video, we turn it into a graph from T to T plus K and down back down to T, okay? And now we basically, you know, we start with some node here and we are going to walk on this graph with a random walk and we're gonna steer this random walk such that it ends up at this green node right here. And the green node is just exactly the same as the starting node, right? Because, because it's a palindrome, we set it up so that where we start, we should edit the same thing. So basically we want to find a, a, a feature representation that will bring us from here, walking down the graph to the green node. So the green is our positive, they're all the reds are our negatives. We want we don't want to get we, we don't want to end up at the reds. And also all of the all of the things that it can go through in the middle are also our positives. Okay. And so so now we have set up a nice framework where we can um, we can get a a, 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 a setup where we can have the positives, we can have the negatives, and we don't have any human supervision in 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 whatsoever. Okay, so I'm going to skip the, the the details of this and just show you that we can use this now for for label propagation and video. So this is a kind of competition. This is previous state of the art uh, result, and uh, and this is our result. You can see that uh, it's 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 sticking much better to the people and kind of gets less confused uh, when you're yeah, and, and there is also we have numbers to show that we are actually, uh, we're not only better than, than other self-supervised methods, but we are also better than methods that are supervised by, by human labels like ImageNet and stuff like that, okay? Um, another thing that I wanted to quickly show is another way to try to get uh, uh, supervision uh, without kind of getting humans, and that is to use GANs as supervisors. And now I, I, I said that it was kind of a, a, a it's a dangerous, it, it's a dangerous thing because, you know, ideally you would just use more data, but sometimes it's, you, there isn't really more data, especially if you want to find correspondences. Uh, it's very hard to get labeled data for correspondence. And so the idea is we were very much inspired by this very, very old, paper from Eric Leonard Miller from uh, you know, 15 years ago called Congealing. And the idea of that paper was to take a whole bunch of uh, data, data set and it's a nice word, congeal it together to get into correspondence with each other. So these are just, this is di different digits zero from uh, MNIST data set. And the idea is to basically uh, try to warp every single one of these zeros towards a common mean. And as you're warping it towards a common mean, the mean itself is also getting sharper and sharper while all of your uh, 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 constituent data points are also getting sharp, okay? So it's a very nice kind of a precursor to self-supervised uh, methods. Um, and it, it, it works really nice for things like binary data. Um, unfortunately, it didn't really work well for real data. It kind of it, it it when it worked it worked really well but it didn't really work on on complicated data and so that method was kind of forgotten but I always thought it would be kind of nice to revisit it using modern techniques and now we do have modern techniques we have GANs and 
the nice thing about GANs is that GANs kind of, if you look at like these, you know, GAN producing, uh, you know, trained on cats, there is definitely kind of, GANs do know something about correspondence. You can see that those cats that it's producing, they're, as, I as we walk through the latent states, you know, they're not jumping around. There is definitely some kind of smoothness. So it's almost like a video, right, that, that the GANs are generating. And we're thinking, can we use this again as a way to, to as a learning signal? Okay, and so this is our work uh, that we're about to post on archive in the next uh, week or two. We should we should we should have it up. Um, we call it GAN supervised dance visual alignment, and basically the idea is as follows: we're going to generate our training signal that we're going to train from by you train using a GAN, but changing around some of the parameters, the style parameters of a GAN, so that we can have pairs of data that are similar, but not quite the same, okay? And now that we have these pairs, we can train a transformer. This is a, a spatial transformer, not the other kind of transformer. Train a spatial transformer to, tr to find a correspondence, a vector field that cor to, to correspond from this to this, okay? And once we have those correspondences, now we can basically learn how to make a correspondence between all of the data that we have. And then we can basically do congealing, we call it GAN chilling. And so here's an example of what we can do then. We can basically compute an average, a mean, a congealed image of kind of all the cats being aligned or all the human faces being aligned, okay? This kind of like a Easter Island kind of basis. Uh, or we can do cars, all the cars being aligned. And, and here is the horses being aligned. Okay. And so here is here are things that we can do as, as it's training. You can see that you get a kind of the average image, the mean image becomes much, much better. And now you can propagate all the kind of any kind of annotations you have on, in one phase, or one cat. You can use it, use your average to propagate it to all the other cats that you have. So this is kind of a way to get yourself some correspondence. So here is the same thing for, for, for birds. Okay, and now this is a correspondence. There we go, and we can propagate them back. And this is the same thing for humans. Get your average is getting better and better and better. And then we can propagate it, and then we can back go go back to it. Okay, and then we can even do it on YouTube videos. It's kind of it 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 does break down if if like if there's too much zoom, but it's it's a surprisingly robust given that it's basically one frame at a time. You can see that it's, um, yeah. So there you go. It's not not too bad, not too bad. Okay. And we we have some kind of transfer of key points results that 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 seem to be pretty. Pretty cool, and the one thing that I'm very interested in is to try try this on some medical data. But like we looked around, and it, it all looks very complicated. But if somebody is interested in trying it on medical data, uh, we would love to help you out and, and see if how it works. Um, and we can also do you know various cute things like propagate uh, propagate other other ally, uh, you know propagate other cute things um, to the um, yeah. And then we can add add things on your cars and add mustaches and things like this. Uh, okay, so I I'm thinking um, I think maybe I'm out of time. Is that right? When 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 do you want me to end? We have um, we have about you know eight more minutes uh, eight more minutes. Okay okay so let me uh, let me just give you just a quick. Feel or I think I think maybe the first one was really the most rele relevant for you guys. But let me give you just a little taste of of of, of the other two. So getting away from fixed data sets, uh, this I'm not actually completely sure is very relevant to you guys. But I've been kind of worried about having data sets that are fixed forever, right? And come part of it comes from the real world motivation. You know, biological agents never see the same data twice, right? So, you know, it's, it's always like you see a new piece of data. First, it's a test data, right? You, 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 you encounter for the first time. And then uh, if you survive, 
then you get a trainer. If you don't survive, too bad, right? But then you never see this thing ever again, right? That that thing, it basically, once you saw it, that's it. You'll never see it again. Next time it will be something, you know, it might be a tiger, but it will be a different tiger, not exactly the same tiger. Um, and so, and so here, when we have like the standard data set, like ImageNet, and we just train on the same, uh, uh, you know, the same uh, uh, amount of data over and over and over again, it's 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 basically just begging to memorize and 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 discourages generalization. And this actually might also explain why data augmentation is such a big help because data augmentation kind of is random and it, it's randomized at, 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 at you know at every time you see a data it's uh, slightly different because you're adding some random augmentation and um, and so this might be the reason why it, it works so well is because it kind of gets you to not see exactly the same data okay but the thing is that the only reason uh, that people use fixed data set is is the annotation expense right it's because once you annotate a data it's it's very expensive so you just want to use it more than once but with self supervision we don't have that excuse anymore right if we don't need humans to annotate the data there is absolutely no reason to ever see the same data twice because you know there is a huge amounts of data and if you don't need to label it you should never look at the same data more than once, right? You should always kind of push your algorithm to, to see new data, right? And it's kind of like this, this, this continual kind of online learning story. It kind of makes a lot of sense if you think about it it's kind of from, the, from the kind of a train and val uh, split. So you have, you know, you have your training set and you have your validation set, right? And instead of using all of your thing for training, it turns out to be better to train on some amount and then use the rest for, for validation. Well, the same thing for kind of in a continuous case where you, you, you train a training set and then you have the next thing as your validation. And then once you validate on that, then you take the next one and the next one and, that's, and, and it, 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 it makes sense that especially when your data stream is changing, you know, humans are getting heavier, living longer, you know, the, the data you co collected 30 years ago might actually not be that relevant. So it actually makes sense that you kind of you keep training as you're processing your data. And so we have this little uh, uh, work we call it test time training. And the idea here is to use to use a data uh, a self supervision as a way to kind of train on the job. And so if you think about this kind of standard testing error. So your testing error is basically uh, the the loss function between your uh, your your output of your uh, classifier and the correct label given parameters uh, under the distribution two. But the thing is that your new test sample X actually gives you some information about your distribution Q in case that your distribution Q might be different from what you trained on. Okay. And so the idea of our continual testing error is that your, 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 uh, the parameters of your classifier could have X, could be a function of X, could be a function of your testing sample, okay? And so now it's kind of like you have a one sample learning problem, right? So for every sample, you want to kind of uh, learn what's the best classifier for that sample. Of course, you don't have label, but we can have so self-supervision. And so the idea is like, this is a very simple kind of instantiation of it. Let's say that you're, you want to classify images. So you, this, you give this image and you say, okay, this is a bird. So this is, this is what you train on. But you also, at the same time, you have another self-supervised training loss. And in this case, we are just using the stupid uh, rotation prediction. So we basically, we randomly rotate the image for four ways. And then we ask it to predict which of the four rotations it, it, it predicts, right? So we basically train it to do both of those tasks, but it's using a shared feature, okay? And now at test time, of course, we don't have any labels that tells you what, what image, what label this image is, but we still can produce a label for our self-supervised task because we can always just 
randomly rotated image and then you know the label is how much you have rotated it so we can still update this network a little bit at test time to see if we can get it to be a little bit more attuned to the test sample that we are looking at okay and basically that's the idea so the idea is that we are going to fine tune your uh, network at test time before we classify our test sample okay and so here we have an example where uh given this image in the beginning the network was a little bit confused and it thought that this was a dog but after doing a little bit of self supervised training we saw that basically the elephant becomes more and more confident and the dog less and less confident uh so it's kind of adjusted the the features so that it would it so it realized that it was after all an elephant okay and another nice thing about this is that um we can think of it as like every single new test example is kind of a start you know starting from scratch a completely new problem and then we 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 adjust our parameters from scratch right or and i like this actually more we can think of it as in, in an online version where is that every new piece of data fine tunes the model that we have we are kind of updating so we are done we don't start start from the pristine model all the time but we just keep fine tuning and this way we can handle smoothly changing distributions because every new sample adjusts our model a, a little bit and so it kind of follows the the distribution as the distribution is changing okay and we see that we actually can get uh quite a, quite a bit of an improvement uh compared to previous methods using this using this trick and we also showed this for uh um a lot uh, for um adapting from a uh, uh robot training on sim in simulation to a uh, robot if deployed in on a real robot uh and you can see that this is the simulation and this is the real robot and you can see that uh, kind of the real robot is able to uh to do the same task as the simulation even though you know it's much more noisy and we actually also add some you know some some cool uh, strobe lighting there to confuse it even more and it's still able to do this because it's able to do this adaptation okay so i'm not going to talk about the the last one uh because it's also the most the most uh, maybe but basically oops sorry but basically the story is to get away from semantic categories the one way to do it is to use data driven bottom up association to get away from fixed data set continuous live learning and to get away from fixed objectives uh emergent objectives which are basically trying to get some kind of arm, arms races and get your ad adversarially create new objectives automatically by the algorithm. all right thank you very much and i'm happy to answer questions Thank you, Professor Ipres. That was really, really wonderful. We, uh, I think I'm sure our audience have a lot of questions. Um, we're going to transition to fireside chat, uh, which will be moderated by Professors Akshay Chowdhury and Mirabel Arusu. Hi, Dr. Uh, Efros, and uh, hello all the participants to the retreat. That was a very, uh, very fascinating talk. I have a ton of questions, and I sh as, as uh, Dr. Young mentioned, I'm sure we all do. Um, as folks are getting ready with their questions, please um, type them into the chat. And if you do want to uh, speak up, uh, just raise your hand using the reaction button, and then um, We'll we'll get uh, we'll get started. So I don't see anything in the chat as, as of right now. So maybe I'll ask the first question and then I'll pass it to my co-moderator Akshay uh, Chaudhary, also an assistant professor in the uh, IBIS division. So my question for you is: We know very well that some of these uh, models that we are developing can be biased. Um, right, um, and a lot of it comes from the data. Some of it comes also how we set up the the problems. Um, how do we go around having issues with propagating bias when we do self-supervision, when we use um, and augment ma mainly from a data set that we have? That's a, that's a very good question. Actually, we, um, 
I've been worried about uh, data set bias for a very long time. Before it was cool, um, <laughs> uh, we, we had one of the early papers, we call, uh, we call it unbiased look at data set bias. And our conclusions were maybe somewhat pessimistic, but also kind of just, um, uh, our conclusions were that it's basically, you can't, I don't think there is any way around it, uh, that I think we'll just have to learn to live with bias, mainly because it's impossible to define what does it mean to not have a bias. In fact, you know, we have, there is, there is a, depending on, for example, let's say you're looking at navigation and you, maybe you put a, 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 a camera on your forehead and then you record all that data, right? Um, whether you are a human or a pigeon, your view of your world is going to be completely different, even though it's exactly the same world. The world has not changed at all, but your experience of the world is going to be tremendously different. So which one is correct, right? One is a human bias, the other is a pigeon bias. You know, which one do we want? Well, it's it depends, right? It depends on the task. Um, that's why I think the best case scenario is, like I said in the beginning, if you're in a very nice and happy position where you your your task and your 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 distri data distribution are the same at training time and at test time then i think you know you, it's going to be biased but it's kind of exactly the right bias that you want so like if you are if you're treating a, a patients of you know whatever set of you know 100 nationalities that come to stanford hospital and you're training on those 100 nationality of patients if you expect the same distribution of nationality to keep coming in you know next year and the year after you're you're good to go right it's it's only when things start to change or only when somehow you realize that the data you trained on does not actually fit with the test data that you will need to use at test time um having said that I think a lot of the, the a lot of the bias that uh, that that you know is in the news and 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 is kind of getting getting uh, getting talked about in, uh, in 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 regards to computer vision is actually a label bias, right? Uh, when when again a human puts some label on an image, and that that label is actually not a very good label for this image, right? And in that, that's kind of a, a re, uh, one of the reasons I am a big fan of self, uh, of self supervision because just getting the human out of that process, at least on the labeling side, is always going to be, keep you closer to the true data. So that's why I think I guess in 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 the medical context, instead of labeling with like a name of a disease, which who knows maybe it's the wrong name or maybe you know there is a, a similar name or maybe you know in different in different countries it's called something else or maybe it actually it's a it, you know it turns out to be a wrong name and it's actually three diseases. Instead of doing that, labeling with something that's much more data driven, like you know. Uh, treatment outcomes or like life expectancy or something that's actually that's not going to change over time is is one way to try to get away from some of this bias so i think the less kind of human there is in your process the less bias you're going to have but you i don't think you will ever get going to get rid of it completely Thank you. Very, very nice answer. Akshay, do you want to take it away? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I have quite a few questions, but I think I'll forego them for all the uh, audience questions that are being posted. And maybe I'll start with a question that was posted in the chat by Kurt Langlotz, who says that CT was used as an example of why self-supervised learning is not necessary because we have so much data. But we actually have very little label data because labeling scans uh, can be expensive. 
Wouldn't that suggest that self-supervised methods have strong appeal in medical imaging? And maybe I could add an additional part to that question. Uh, in the second part of your presentation, you said that self-supervised learning can be appealing when our training data sets are not fixed. With medical imaging, we see that our data sets are quite stationary. There could be temporal shifts, there could be spatial shifts. So I'd be curious as to what your take is on that. So, yeah, I'm, okay, I'm, I, I'm very, very confused about kind of this, this, the, the, I, I, I guess I don't understand a lot of the you know tricks of, of of the medical imaging trade, but it seems to me that you guys actually have a lot of labels for your for your medical scans, right? Because the medical scans are part of the medical history. So you with a scan there is there is you know the standard things like age and. Uh, you know, gender and, and whatever, you know, blood pressure and all that stuff, right? And I guess if you just do a little bit more work, you should be able to kind of uh, look at outcomes like, like you know, life expectancy or, or, or whatever, like, like uh, what is survive, you know, how many years they live, you know, and, 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 and things like this, right? Uh, I think that this is actually a fantastic amount of data. So for example, I would Im imagine that like if you are, if, if you have a uh, doing, and, and if, in this case, maybe like a self-supervised task might be a kind of a cool, cool way. For example, you take your C CT scan and you try to predict the, the age of the patient, right? And then presumably for healthy patients, that, class, that, that predictor is going to work very well, but maybe for an unhealthy patient, it may be uh, predict the age to be older than, than it actually is. And then you say, okay, something is, something is a little bit off. Right, but but I think fundamentally, I think there is a lot of labels, and it's it it might be that some of these labels are maybe not exactly the labels that you want at this particular time, like you know uh, a picture of a lesion somewhere, right? But but you do have a lot of a lot of data, it, it, and it's I guess it's some work to try to kind of collate it all together and and have it available, but but I think this is it's a mind. It's a goldmine of of of, a, of 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 cool uh, data that could be used, um, and 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 some of it again, as I as I mentioned before, some of it might actually be less biased data. Like it's it's much less biased to kind of to have a patient's age than to uh, to kind of to kind of have some sort of a segmented lesion region, which which some uh, radiologists label where you know they may or may not be correct or or, or things like this, right? So I think that it's it's kind of weird to me that you know when I whenever I talk to radiologists, uh, their data sets are usually extremely small, like you know thousands of, of of scans. Whereas I presume that one has you know millions or tens of millions, right, available, and and it seems like this is just just a lot of gold just sitting there in in these. Uh, 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 on my charts all over the world, just waiting to be used. Maybe I'll have Kurt respond to that briefly from a clinical perspective, and then we'll move on to a question by Anthony, who had his hand raised. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, a thousand is a, is a big data set for us. So, so <laughs> right, there is a lot of clinical data, uh, but it's got all of the issues with labels. So, you know, there's not a perfect correlation between information in the medical record or even the report and the image. So it's actually quite expensive even to generate labels from the other data that we have. So in, I guess that just, so anyway, I mean, to me, it's a positive message. I think that the techniques that you described today are very much relevant to what we do. Yeah, I, I just wanna say that like a lot of these issues like they are totally solvable issues. You know, there are people, in, you know, next door to me, you know, working on databases, like database researchers and computer science departments. Like they know how, to, I, it's it's not tricky, it's not, it's not easy, but it's not like fundamentally hard. It just, somebody needs to get, get this data and just hook up all of those data sets together. Like it's, like we know how to do this. And 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 I, I'm just, I, I feel it's kind of, it's kind of sad that 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 you know because I would love to have access to all of this data too. I would love to work on this, and and so 
because a thousand scans, frankly, like for, you know, okay, these scans are, are larger, so you have more pixels, but like in my field, like when we have only a thousand data points, we just, we say, okay, that's that's just not going to work. Like we, we don't even touch anything with only a thousand data points because we know it's just, it, it's not going to train well, right? Um, so I'm, I, yeah, I, I, I want to, I want to encourage you to, to bug your, your database people in, in the Stanford computer science department to just get on it and just fix this because this, these are all fixable problems. Um, what I would like to add is that you can see all of us smiling as we are, uh, you are saying all these things. We all want the same thing. We are all working towards getting all this, um, the scans and it's not as trivial as we would like it. It's not a problem of storage or database. Uh, I think uh, Sandy also mentioned it's a, a privacy issue as well, among others. Right, right. I understand that part, but but there is also solutions for that. The, the paper, the, right. There is some really nice work on, 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 on differential privacy that, that might be useful, yeah. Um, and I do want to uh, go ahead with one question from the audience, from Jean Long, um, that uh, mentions that, uh, thank you for the wonderful presentation. Um, my question is even, it seems like self-supervised learning could save the effort of exhausting uh, annotation. Um, however, it's still based on a limited data set, which we provided. How does it deal with overfitting issues with limited data? Well, I think that's that's the argument I, I'm trying to make. That once you have self supervision, you don't you should not be limited by the, the by the by the data set. The, the, there is, in fact, there's. I think once you're you 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 buy onto the whole self supervision story, you shouldn't have a data set, right? You should just you know, patient comes in, you just process that. Next patient process that, and and. Just keep it keep it as a kind of an, an online uh, continual mode because because the whole point of a data set having a data set is because you know once you label something you want to keep it around because it was expensive to label right but if you have like this pipeline of of just always getting new data and not needing to label it then then you don't really need to have a small data set I think I'm completely agree with you that if you if you still have the small data set then no, then self-supervised methods are not going to do much more, much better for you. They might do a little bit better because um, you can think about this in terms of uh, how much kind of label signal do you have per image. So for example, let's say ImageNet. ImageNet, you have um, you know, a million images, but then every image has only one label. You know, it's like, it's a dog or it's a car or it's a cat, etc. right? So you get like one thing per image. Whereas with self-supervised learning, for example, something that we did was a, a colorization task. So we take a grayscale image and then we try to predict its color, right? Uh, and that you basically, you have one label, one color that you predict per pixel. So every image, has now, you know, hundreds of thousands of things that you predict instead of a single thing to predict. So you can kind of get a little bit more juice out of your limited data set because you are kind of you have you have more you can generate more of these labels than what a human generates for you. So there is a little bit that you can get that way, but on the other hand, those those kind of self-supervised labels might not be as powerful. And they might not be exactly what you're looking for. And so in, in, in general, I think small data is always going to be a problem. And it's the first thing to do is to try to get your data bigger and then, and then life will always becomes better. I think one of the interesting facts that this brings up is there's a requirement to have these generalizable and robust embeddings that we can build up in a self-supervised manner. But uh, this is a nice question that was asked by Belize Gunnell in the audience who's asking about, is there a principal way to pick a pretext task, knowing what is a downstream task of interest that we care about? Um, is this this data set dependent? Do we need an RL policy to figure out the right task, the right data set? Uh, how do you think about that? Great question. Uh, and I have no idea. Um, and I don't think anyone has a good idea. Uh, we know that it's very relevant, like this example I showed with the contrastive learning where 
where the the type of data augmentation. So like now the different data augmentations in contrastive learning are kind of like the pretext tasks in a classical self supervision, and and we do see that a lot of work is is spent just hacking all those data augmentations to kind of connect with the task. So for example, a huge data augmentation, like the, the, the data augmentation that really w- made things work way, way better is cropping. So you take an image and you crop a part of it and you throw it in the, in the, in the, in the, in the bin. Uh, but that works, that really works well for, for a task of uh, classific- uh, Im- image classification. You know, is it, is it a car or is it a dog or is it a cat, right? Whereas you basically, you know, you have a cat in the middle or you have a dog in the middle of the image and so cropping actually helps it out. If your task is detection, like you're fine trying to find the cat in the image and there may be like many different other things, then cropping actually is a really bad idea and it will make, make things worse for you. Um, so I think it's a great question. I think right now people just, just you know, it, there's, it's, it's, it's art. You know, people just come up with things that they think might be useful, but nobody really knows anything better than this. Uh, and, you know, this is why we kind of, we were looking at trying to do self-supervision from a video because the argument is, well, a video is a whole bunch of real data all strung together with time. Maybe that's going to be useful. But, you know, there's pluses and minuses. So I think at this point, Everybody's trying, you know, we also try to kind of automatically try to do some meta learning to try to discover the perfect pretext task. Yeah, never, never, never worked. So, yeah, I think this is open question, open question. Yes. Um, Anthony uh, Gatti still has a question, so we can let him ask uh, in person. Thank you. I, so I typed mine out. I was curious when I saw the Gangeo, the thing that stood out to me was it looks like a lot like image registration. Um, exactly. It is. It is. Okay. So, um, so but one, it's, but it's image I, registration without any, like we, like there's no human labels. It's automatic. So then I definitely think the image, uh, the imaging community would be quite interested in, in the method applied for image registration. So one of my other questions was, do you think, can it, or do you think it can be transferred to other modal? other data types. So I work with point cloud data or surface meshes of bones, for example. So could we apply it there, number one? And then the second point is, uh, which I have, I'm have i worried about the answer based on some of your comments previously, how much data is likely needed to, to, to train this type of model? Right, uh, so meshes, I think are actually, believe it or not, meshes I think are easier than, than pixel data. In, in many ways uh, in terms of complexity. So I think you probably need less mesh data than you need pixel data. So that's a good news. Um, so the, 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 basically our method is uh, contingent on, on, a, on training a good GAN. So if you can train a GAN like a style two GAN, for example, on your data, which, you know, 10,000 images plus maybe, uh, maybe maybe a thousand if it's really, really kind of boring, consistent data, um, then then we can talk. Uh, so that, yeah. And by the way, if, 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 if anyone is interested, try their data and you guys have, you know, enough of it to train a good GAN, uh, please email me. I'll, I'll hook you up with the, with the, with, with the graduate student who is, who is, would be eager to, to work with you to try it because I think, I, I feel like this could be a very useful tool for 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 folks like you guys. Uh, and but you know we don't know anything about this data, so it would be great to 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 to, to work with you guys and, and make it happen. Yeah, we're very yeah. very eager. so. Just email me and I'll I'll set it up. Sounds great. But, thank but you we do much. need lots of data. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So thank you. And maybe uh, I know we're a couple of minutes over, but we have one more question by Rohir van der Sloys, uh, who asks that SSL uh, self-supervised learning solves some of the problems with incorrect human annotations, but how can we ultimately evaluate the performance of learned representations? Is there a better alternative than linear evaluation on ImageNet that may have noisy labels too? Oh my God, I'm, I, it, you know, the whole linear thing on ImageNet 
it's it's I'm very ashamed of it because like this was this was this came out from my lab and we thought we would just do it once be, because it just we didn't have enough GPUs to do the proper thing, and then it just kind of took off, and now everybody's doing it. it I'm I'm very sorry. That that is, it's a very bad evaluation. I completely agree, and I wish that we 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 didn't go down that path. Um, definitely, the right way to evaluate it is on some sort of a well-defined task, right? And and the hope is that for some sort of a task that people actually need there would be like a nice, either a labeled test set, because, you know, labeling test sets is not as bad as labeling training sets, right? Uh, especially if you, you know, if you do it properly and you just, you you have your labels stashed somewhere in an undisclosed location and like you're only allowed to test on it like once every half a year or something, right? So people don't overfit. So like, you know, we that, that this this is not, that's, that's, that would be like the gold standard, some really useful, important task that you can send your, submit your code and like train and, and test on it, you know, once once in every half a year. And then we can see if there is actual progress being made. Uh, and that would be, that would be a great setup. But, but this is something that of course, you know, one needs to really have a, a good task that is actually universally agreed to be useful. Um, I think I think one could also have tasks that are kind of self-supervised self-supervised test testing as well, right? So if you can predict something that's not human defined, I think that would be the best. Like you know, uh, survival rates. Like given given a scan, you know, is the person still alive five years down the road? Right. Well, that's 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 a very a very kind of human it, it's it's not there is no human labeling involved in that right I, you just need to get the data and then you know the patient di died or the patient didn't die, right and that that again to me sounds like a great evaluation again if we kind of hide it in some closet and only let people uh, test on it like once every half a year uh that would be that would be a great thing as well so i'm i i think if 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 your community is is willing to kind of come up with this kind of gold standard evaluation, I think that would actually be great for all of us because I think everybody knows that you know linearly testing on ImageNet is really really a stupid idea, and we would love to you do something you know more useful and more more objective. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Point definitely taken about uh, using higher order tasks, uh, but again. Uh, I just wanted to thank you, Dr. Efros, for taking the time and for having a great discussion and trying to answer all the questions that we posed. I think it's really inspiring to try to bring together the medical imaging communities with the CS communities to try to figure out the problems that both the communities face and then hopefully try to find a solution that converges in the middle. So thank you again for the time. So maybe a round of applause virtually in Zoom for that wonderful presentation. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Professor Efros.